Hello, May. Thank you for yes, being sir. willing to join on the Gwyn huddle. Thank you for having me. Wouldn't miss yeah, it. Thank you. So I guess for people who don't know you super well, can you tell us a bit about where you're from and, and kind of describe your journey as well from, I know you worked, it started in, you know, working at McDonald's and then took a leap and started working at um, Microsoft and tech. So would love to just hear that journey. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, initially I was born in India, um, you know, born in Gujarat, moved to America when I was three, um, moved around a bunch. My dad was a consultant, so we were like, in, like Texas for like three months and like all over. So I was in Washington State and kind of like grew up there for the most part. Um, started at McDonald's and my mom was like, you're 15 and a half, legal age, you're working, you know? So she like, she was working at a bank at the time and McDonald's manager, manager was coming by. So she's like, hooked my son up with a job. So I was at the drive through at you know noon every day, just like taking orders, figuring that out. Um, but, you know, as I was like getting into my high school kind of senior year, I just got really into business. Um, and I had this opportunity to intern at Microsoft on like the Xbox consumer engagement team. And it was like, it's going to Redmond every day, which is Microsoft HQ, like talking about random stuff, analyzing their newsletters, like really random stuff that nobody wanted to do, but it was just cool to be in that environment. And also very quickly taught me, I don't want to work in the corporate right. environment. Um, being there, um, there's like 50,000 people on campus, you know, really felt like a different experience. Yeah. Um, and I went, when I went to college, it was a really interesting time where I started school in 2012, the social network movie came out in 2010. Mm -hmm. So as I was going to school, there was this like big zeitgeist around uh, starting a startup and becoming a founder and like being a founder kind of became a sexy concept, you know, and like hackathons and all that really started in that era. Mm -hmm. So I was like, very much swept up in that culture, like I started the entrepreneurship club on my campus. I was like going to hackathon, you know, 24 hours straight, just coding and, you know, doing all that um, and following along like Silicon Valley and TechCrunch. But at the same time, as I got deeper into school, I was starting to get more into music, music culture, um, like Noisy by Vice was in Atlanta with like Migos and Chief mm -hmm. Keef, like, you know, early on, like Young Thug, um, SoundCloud was blowing up, you know, it was like the early chance there, early era of like Childish Gambino you know, all of those yeah. artists. And so I was like on one side falling in love with like the idea of like building tech. On the other side, I was, I was also falling in love with this idea of like music and creativity and music culture, especially. Yeah. And after a while, I just started seeing some of the stuff that was getting built in Silicon Valley. Um, I saw like a, almost like a personality distance at that point from that kind of world and that worldview where I was like, you know what? I have these tech skills. I want to like do something yeah. with them. But I'd rather like take those tech skills and impact culture mm -hmm. and art and like help creatives with that skill set rather than going to big tech. Because there's a million and one developers right. out there. Not a lot of people that are helping like creatives with technology skills. And so I was like, you know what? I want to work in music. Um, had no connections out there. No, I had never left Seattle for internships. So I was like, you know what? First step, let me get out of Seattle, get to LA. Like it's obviously where everyone is. Um, got the chance to intern at Hulu on their personalization team in 2016. So moved out there that summer and very randomly through the internet. It's a really long story, but I'd met both of my co-founders through the internet, like via Facebook or just like online before I met them in person. But we ended up meeting in 2016. Um, one of them, Vlad, was Metro Boomin store manager at the okay. time. We're very tapped yeah. in like with rap. It was like 2016, wild year for Metro. Um, and then Chuka, my other co-founder, had been at Techstars as a designer. Mm -hmm. And then Charles Gambino found his portfolio and I was like, you got to come create direct because the internet. And so he kind of came from the wild, like, you know, tech pedigree, design pedigree. Vlad was like with all the rappers. I was like the tech nerd <laughs> in the middle. Um, but we kind of came into music at this very interesting time where you know, the tech world in 2016 was talking about machine learning, big data, even like chatbots for all this like chat GPT yeah. stuff. In 2016, this, the music world was like, oh, the SoundCloud thing is interesting. Like streaming is coming. But I think at that point, physical sales were still like 60, 70 percent of all the sales and so streaming wasn't like a immediate priority for a lot of yeah. people they didn't really look at the data the way the tech world was looking at it so they're like all right why don't we be the guys that like clearly know how to take this data and use it for other things uh to help these brands help these creators um but let's be like the guys that help like these labels these artists navigate to do this digital change because streaming was very inevitably going to come into the industry um to start an agency and our initial idea was like we'll build fire websites for artists and make them really plugged up to data collection. And that will be our entry point into like helping manage people's data. Um, networking around, got very lucky. I ended up meeting the label TV that summer. 
and they're like, yo, you guys seem cool. Like Kendrick just dropped Dam. Like he's going crazy. We have to put all, all our resources on him. Um, we have this artist we've been, we've been incubating. Her name is SZA. You guys should do her website, do her rollout. And so like September of 2016 onwards, um, we started working with SZA on CTRL, where she'd like come over to our house, you know, draw on her whiteboard, wow. like scan those into the website, like very iterative process. She went through like three or four concept changes where like we fully had made like graphic animations for a website that we scrapped like three or four times. Wow. Um, as you kind of evolve your creative process. Um, but, you know, it was really dope, obviously, because it became CTRL over time. And I remember the day we dropped that website, we were teasing the single Love Hello with Travis Scott. And, you know, you like go on the website, you press your keyboard keys and play different sounds. And um, the day we dropped the website, I had a psych 101 midterm. I had one year of classes left. So I like told my parents, I'm just going to come back to Seattle for midterms and fly back to LA. And so the day we were like six months working with SZA, um, psych 101, just to get my credits out the way. I like push up the site the first day, walk into this midterm, and I walk 50 minutes to a psych 101. Like, yeah. you know, very simple. I walk out, my phone's blown up because it's like, oh snap, site crashed. Like as soon as you oh, push no. it up, you know, I was like, oh, site. Like, but that was the moment where I was like, oh, this is dope. Like this is what I want to yeah. do. You know, I want to build like these creative technology ideas with these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just kept on adding to that, you know, over time, it was like, all right, cool. Like web starts are great. What else can we do with that kind of skill set? Mm-hmm. We start learning about digital marketing. Um, 2018 kind of became this digital marketing hub for a lot of these record labels as they were rolling out um, and putting out projects. Yeah. Um, got to spend a bunch of record label money to like really learn how to grow things online. And then as we kind of got to 2020, we kind of realized that, you know, this whole new generation of artists, these kids at home, uh, whether you're an artist musically a podcaster someone write a newsletter like all sorts of visual arts written arts everything we can really build that into a business today if you're very passionate right. about it and a lot of folks don't want to do that which is totally fine but for the folks that want to do it there weren't always historically tools to help them streamline their marketing like if they could go and use hubspot which is like 500 bucks a month yeah. or finesse mailchimp which is 50 50 bucks a month um but no one had kind of taken these concepts of like you know, taking all in one marketing and putting it into one place at a really affordable price. And we've been doing it by hand. We're kind of in this place where we knew all the pieces required. So we took all these learnings we had, put it into this product symphony, um, and then put it out in 2022. Um, and at the moment, there's like 60,000 artists on the platform now. Um, but the plan is like, you know, how do we take all this digital experience we have and democratize it for the next 100 million kids out there that want to build a career out there? Right. And, and how has been like that reception from just I guess the music industry as a whole has it been I'm sure there are artists who are super down to use I guess symphony and and are really interested in in how it can kind of help them and and their campaigns but I don't know is there a side that where it's kind of harder to I don't know convince people to use it and that it's actually a great tool for to benefit them I think um I think last year became like really because I think the music industry changes when it comes to marketing and what we talk about. I think last year people were like trying to find the thing that can help them cut through. Right. So we came in at a time like, hey, artists, like if you're broke or can't afford an agency or just have a little bit of budget to spend, here's this tool where you can press a few buttons and run really smart yeah. ads. And so off top, I feel like it really started gaining traction with a certain subset set of artists. Um, I think this year now the conversation is super fans and like direct to consumer and things like that. And so as we kind of build up the tool set, we're very much keenly aware of the conversation happening right. and the things we're building out are to try and kind of push people in the direction of thinking with these best practices, mm-hmm. right? Like a super fan is a reinvention of the term that maybe was around five years ago with D2C yeah. and before five years before that, it was like e-commerce, right. you know, it's like we just reinvent terms for ways of capturing audience attention and monetizing yeah. it. Um, so all that said, like, it's been very much, I think, timely as artists kind of realize yeah. that they have the power in their hands. Um, what's been really exciting too is, you know, seeing a few artists kind of take it for their rollouts and just build up to a wild place. Like Tanache, like, you know, six months ago, signed up and did a pre-save campaign for Symphony for her first single in this rollout. Um, and all the way up until Nasty, until today, she's been using Symphony. Yeah, and, amazing. and so even for like an artist that, you know, is super big or has this audience built in, they can still buy, find value from these tools. And I think what's also powerful with that is we're defining this shared language around data between like the kid at home that's dropping their first right. song all the way to like the Cash Cobain and James Blake's and Tanashi's of the world, which I don't think ever existed like that where we can all speak one language as a unit of, of the creator. Yeah, oh, definitely amazing. Um, 
yeah, I mean, we've benefited a lot from it at Gwen and, and using Symphony. You guys make it very easy to to kind of use. So thank you for building something. Try, try. Lots on the way, you know, lots on the way. We're um, on that front. We're thinking a lot about AI in like a really meaningful way too, where I think, um, you know, people are always like AI, ChatGPT, make me a marketing yeah. plan. And ChatGPT is like, yo, like here's a general marketing plan and go run some yeah. ads. I think we're in this very unique position where we built all the activation tools into Symphony. And so now when our version of GPT, we're, call, we're calling it Maestro AI, when it comes yeah. out, right? If you ask it to make a marketing plan, it can tell you how to make it, but then already has all the things you, you want to do already built in. So like builds you a landing page automatically, runs your ad automatically, teaches you over time why it's working. And so we're thinking about this almost as an educational process too for all these folks at home that don't have an agency or a marketing person to talk to, but could benefit from this knowledge that built into the Oh, that's very cool. And and how would it go? So like after the campaign, would it take all that information and then give you more, I guess, recommendations based off of how that audience responded? Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And even even beyond that, right? I think we're we're now in this era with the super fan wave of like, all right, you're an artist, you have to think about your music, your following, but also how are you monetizing, how are you building a email list, how are you pushing merchandise? Yeah. So I think like thinking holistically as like a full marketing funnel and teaching this thing how to think like that as well, hopefully it gives people a very clear jumping off point, whether it's like, I just dropped a song, I have zero budget, you can still use Symphony. I just dropped a song, I'm Cash Cobain, you can still use Symphony. Right. Wow, very cool. And so, um, yeah, I guess tell me about your relationships with your co-founders. Um, how, how did you guys meet? Or, well, no, now I guess I know how you, how you guys met, but um, how do you kind of split the work at, at Symphony? and um and keep that balance yeah um very diligently you know so definitely something we have to kind of learn over time because you know initially we started this agency together and like we were just living we were living together for the first seven years of just running yeah. that um so you've learned a lot about someone living with right. them and, and building a business with them um in the best way possible right and some folks don't make it through that but my co-founder and i and Vlad, our other partner as well like we've definitely made it through like seven eight years of just doing that um, but I think the biggest thing you kind of learn, especially when starting a company or any sort of relationship that's long term, you know, it's like, can you work through things together and like work through roadblocks? Because I think that's like true of any long term relationship. But I think especially with the like, business relationship with co-founders, especially um, we've had petty fights when we were 22. Yeah. We have different fights now when we're 28, 29, 30. Um, but all those petty fights kind of ironed out all the stuff that were just like first principles, base kind of relationship rules. And now, you know, as we kind of got into building more businesses, building out management for our company, building out more distribution stuff, now building out Symphony, um, I think we're at a, like a very mutual understanding of like, all right, like Chuka, like you're really good on the ground partnerships. You spearhead that explicitly and let me take over this, this, and this. Um, and I think there's a mutual trust now built in at the time, which I think is hard to replicate if you just meet someone, but like now after all this time, this mutual trust can kind of let me just step back and be like, all right, he's got it. I'm not going to like micromanage or whatever. Yeah. And he mutually respects me in that same Yeah, thing. that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's definitely something that I guess takes time. Um, and something I've also learned, I mean, with Milan, he's my brother. So it's. How does that feel? Yeah. Like having working with family directly, like, do you feel like it's, are you kind of worked out? Like everything you guys want to argue Yeah, about? I think I, similar to like what you said, we both have very different strengths. Um, I feel like people always joke, you know, never work with family, <laughs> but in many ways, it's kind of a blessing because we know each other so well. We know just honestly what each other's strengths and weaknesses are. So we really kind of tap into it. Obviously, it took time as well. Like we've also been in it for um, six years now at Gwyn. But um, but yeah, like he's he's great at like implementing, you know, tech at Gwyn and and like a lot of like the operations and the foundation of of just building the team and structure of Gwen and and I'm now more kind of face forward with like artists and and on a day to day with you know our legals and, and the signing of the artists and and that whole process and so we've kind of found our our strengths and and stick to that and and it, it's been very helpful we we're very honest with each other and and give each other feedback so it's been it's been good yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel like the honesty is the biggest key, yeah. right? Is you can like, um, someone once told me like, do you want honesty or do you want kindness? Right. And, like yeah. sometimes you can't have both, and especially with like a sibling or someone you've worked for a long time, like yeah. 
you kind of know when to take, take those. Yeah, titles, exactly. You know? And sorry, I know you've been, well, you've already fundraised once and, and now you're deep in it again. Um, so how, how has that process been as a founder and do you have any insider learning lessons from it? Yeah. Um, honestly, I've learned so much because I've been following like TechCrunch mm -hmm. and like, you know, Hacker News, all these traditional like tech publications for now 10 plus years. Yeah. But I've been in this wild music world, right? Yeah. Very different like kind of reality than the tech world. And now I'm back in the symphony. I think like all those things I learned, like, you know, watching like YC Startup School, and, like Product Hunt, all those things, like kind of came to fruition now where I can put it to work now. Um, but when it comes to fundraising, they're always like, yo, like fundraising is a full-time yeah. job. And I'm realizing now more than ever. And I think the, the biggest thing I learned is it's all about the relationships you build mm -hmm. that ultimately, because like people want to invest in people they care yeah. about, people they like, they want to work with. And so I feel like this fundraise is the first time I've been able, able to open so many doors, but it's because like the last year and a half, I've just been like developing relationships with amazing people that are in the right spaces to fund me with the right investors. Um, and it's also something I've historically had, you know, like working in music, I can't just call up like a homie and be like, who are the 20, 30 investors, right. you know? So that's like, I think like fundraising is definitely, is definitely I'm realizing a long-term mindset of just like building with investors, staying them tapped in, um, even if they don't invest now, you know, staying in touch with them just as friends. Yeah. Um, but down the line, it's a, it's a long career, you know, there's a long life, which is even five years is a long time in like tech yeah. or VC world. Um, so like saying it's up to people always pays off, even if it's not an immediate thing that, you know, you're getting from them or you're giving to them. Yeah, you know? oh, definitely difficult process, but wishing you <laughs> all the luck. You guys will kill it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I know, yeah, building a startup can be really grueling and, and you have to wear kind of a lot of hats and get people to see your vision. What what are some of like the habits and perspectives that you kind of keep and, and build to stay sane and, and cultivate kind of the grand vision for symphony? Yeah. Wow. This is, a, I th I've thought about this a lot, actually the last six months. Um, I think the, the biggest kind of unlock I made personally was thinking about things and almost like a, um, like a full, like top three priorities per day type thing. Right. So every week I like start off with like, what are the five things we have to get mm -hmm. done? this week to progress the business by 5%, 10%, just an arbitrary number yeah. even. And then every day I actually time block everything I'm working on, like down to the minute. And so every day I'm like, all right, you know, as a founder, as an executive, as just someone running anything, there's always going to be things hitting you with that are feel like high priority. Yeah. Um, but I just keep one notice app where I have all my things. And I just take like the three most important things and I'm just reading it and like put them to the yeah. top. If you just do that enough times over time, you end up working on the highest impact things. You might not be able to get to everyone, right. unfortunately. Yeah. And I'm learning that now more than ever. Where like the first like year since me, I was doing customer support. I gave a bunch of artists my phone number. <laughs> um, like all these things where I was like, you know, I was really on the ground mm -hmm. because I had the time and like bandwidth to be. Now it's like partnerships and fundraising and like long term innovation ideas. Yeah. I'm realizing some of those things I used to do, I just kind of delegate to my team mm -hmm. and like empower them to even make the same mistakes I did to learn how to do the job. Um, so I can think about like those top three right. things, and those top 10, 10 things per week. Um, but I would say like be very, very honest about your time. Mm -hmm. as a founder. Um, Cause it's very easy to get caught up at like an event or like doing this or that. But at the end of the day, it's a business, you know, if that's your intention to build a business, a revenue based right. business. So everything at the end of the day, every hour you spend is measured against how much revenue you generate as a VC backed business. Yeah. And so I think founders should just be very honest about how they're spending their time. And it's something I'm still continually exercising as a muscle, but um, I think it's helped me over time get more focused and even learn uh, what drives the business actually versus what doesn't. Yeah, no, very valuable. And how, how big is your team now? Yeah, there's um there's eight of us um, kind of spread across the U.S. right now. There's actually going mm -hmm. ham. We have two interns okay. um, and then five developers. Okay, wow, great. Well. Very nice. Set up across the yeah, board. love it. And is there like a particular story you have in mind, or you remember that you thought maybe um, you may not have had like a particular skill and, and felt like you couldn't learn it, but you look back at it now and say, you know, I, I really became that person that I needed to build my startup. Yeah, so, honestly, I feel like that every three months, to be yeah. honest, because. Um, what I realized, like now I've been also just like working kind of for myself since I was like 21. So now I'm like 10 years of entrepreneurship almost. And um, 
I think anyone can be an entrepreneur if they want to, right? I think like the biggest hurdle is that entrepreneurship requires you to just be in a personal growth mindset all the time yeah. because, you know, I have to figure out, I'm doing like 18 month projections and then hopping onto a call with an investor potentially pitching right. them and hopping on with a customer talking about our product and hopping on with my team, yeah. like kind of pushing them. Um, and so I think like the, it's not even a time. I think it's just like a way of life at the moment where like every six months, I just know that what I knew six months ago uh, is going to be like, I'm going to feel dumb about it because I learned so much more, but it's a good feeling to have. Like if you're running a startup and you always consistently feel like you're learning new things or even like feel like you were a little bit dumber in the past because you're learning so much more. Yeah. I think it's a good sign because it, it shows that you're learning more about the intricacies of the business. Right. And I like nerd out too on, um, on the fundamentals of business, right? Like, all right, like what's our like retention? What's our like funnel? Like all that stuff that ultimately drives the value of the business. Yeah. Um, I think that too has been something that I've dialed into. And I think a lot of founders have benefited from of like really understand the math behind why the business mm -hmm. works. Um, and it's something that, um, kind of every investor looks at, but like, if you really understand yourself as a founder, you can predict where you're taking the business over yeah. time, which is what we're trying to do. Amazing. Now. And are you mostly running the calls on, on these kind of fundraising calls or do you have the support of your two co-founders or how, how does it work? <laughs> It's been, it's been mostly okay. me. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, we, we tried out a lot of configurations, but I think like, cause I'm more deeper in the numbers, like financially speaking and a lot of the product, um, I've just been able to story tell this narrative and I'm like, all right, I'll loop you in on the second call, but let me go yeah. and sell them with this financial map and yeah. all the station stuff. Great. So, yeah, it's a lot of pressure, but <laughs> well done. Balancing, you know, learning. Um, the, I have it on my whiteboard, you know, the only way through it is through right. it. You know, so if you want to learn anything, you got to spend the time learning. Yeah, that's no, true. I think with the startup, you're so deep into everything. You have to wear so many hats that, I don't know, it, it's it's the great thing about being able to kind of build your own business and being able to say that you're able to do, you know, this person, you know, not that you can fully do each person's job, but that you can kind of, I don't know, learn each person's role and, and kind of help through it. But yeah. How has that process been for you, like running, running um, win? Have you felt like you're always just like learning new things at all times? Yes. I'd say when we first started, um, kind of similar to you, like didn't know anyone in music, um, just like had a passion for, for great music and great storytelling that in music that we kind of grew up listening to and, and just wanted to really support artists um, that, that kind of kept that storytelling through their music and, and so, yeah, we initially just started kind of helping artist by artist. We didn't really have the vision of creating a whole label at that time, but it was, yeah, it was very hands-on. It was like seeing what each artist needed, whether it was, you know, support and, and finding a studio and paying for studio time or finding a creative to help with music videos. And, um, and yeah, so in the beginning, it was kind of just us navigating through the industry and, and learning as, as time went. But, um, but yeah, then as, as Gwyn grew, we, it was interesting to just kind of, I guess, figure out how to build a, a record label. I mean, we, we had never done it before. And obviously we brought in people who, who had, but just trying to figure out, you know, how many employees are needed like how many in each team are needed in marketing and creative and an a and r and one i guess struggle that we had over the last few years is figuring out the role of like general manager and and having mm -hmm. like one person kind of running the whole label and and realizing that i don't know it it wasn't like a a role in the end that we fully needed i kind of took it on myself and, and figured it out because I don't know, I feel like it's better to kind of just be deep in it yourself and, and also kind of spreading the responsibilities that a general manager has with each department head and, and kind of giving that, I don't know, confidence to each, each employee. And, and so, yeah, I don't, it's, it's been a journey of, of trying to figure things out, wearing different hats, being able to kind of do a little bit of everything. So yeah, it's, it's definitely been. I love it. Was um was it weird coming into the music industry, like not having worked in it and coming up against, I'm sure, like some inefficiencies that don't exist in other worlds? Yeah. I mean, it's it's such a like human 
business and there's like a lot of flaws in it um and and also kind of growing up in in silicon valley and then being that one person who decided to go into music um was definitely an, an interesting experience and just not having i guess the mentors at the time to to kind of help and navigate the industry but um but yeah i, I would say it's just such a human i don't know industry where you're dealing with so many personalities and and just being one on one with like the artists and and trying to kind of you know their music is is their life it's their art you're they're fully entrusting you with with their life and and taking such a massive risk by you know especially i guess as as a label who at the time like when we first started had no experience you know releasing music and and so it was a massive risk on their part but i think through each release we had we kind of grew and artists slowly you know trusted us more and and we learned from our failings and from our successes but i'd say in the beginning it was a, it was kind of a lot of failures unfortunately and that's obviously how we grew but i think for a lot of artists who kind of you know still hold a little bit of resentment towards us um in in how we kind of dealt with certain releases when we were so young and 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 we just you know couldn't do right by them at the time but but now hopefully they can see that we've kind of learned and grown but yeah they've all kind of been part of the journey but yeah i'd, I'd say in music well like most things you kind of have to fail to kind of learn and get there but but yeah it's been it's been a process. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, all the latest releases feels they feel they look good. They really like you know market. Well. Thank so you. Yeah. Like on the road. Thank you. you know, excited to see what else comes out. Yeah. So we're we're getting there. But thank you. Yeah. So, but yeah, thank you for for joining on the on the Gwen Huddle, and and for of the course. great conversation. Yeah. I wish you all the luck and and fundraising and and growing Symphony and. We're always going to be your number one fan, that Quinn. Shout out to Quinn. Yeah, game. No, no, we're sure. excited to see how you guys keep growing and and all the new features. On yeah. the way, on the way. Uh, but no, I appreciate it. We'll we'll, uh, we'll stay tapped in and as things progress too with this fundraising. Yeah. Thank you.